Boy, it's 2018. Checking in. Hello, YouTube. My name is Tabby. My, my top album, top albums of 7, 2, 18, 2020. They are as follows. 10 is. Uh, Look, Look at me now, now by Chris Brown and Little Weenie. Nine is Carrot. <laughs> Eight is Bodak Clack. Number seven, Peanuts movie soundtrack. Six, Boost Mobile. Oh, fuck. Number the next one, Vines that keep me from ending it all, compilation six. Three is three. What are you? Two is three. Number one is What's up? My hands are exceptionally dry. It's negative every degree outside here in Minnesota. That loud sound you hear is my new little mini heater fan right over there. Say hi. This is my list, my top projects of 2017. 2017 sucked as a whole year, but for music, what the fuck? What the, did so much, so much happened. So much dropped. I still have to go back to some shit. The whole year was bananas. Regardless, 2018 is here and Logan Paul's a piece of shit. I have 10 honorable mentions before we get into my top 15. Can we just make it a New Year's resolution in 2018 and forward for us reviewers or just anybody on YouTube who has an opinion about anything to not have to address before they state their opinion that it's their fucking opinion. Can we just make that a thing? If you do not see what you want on any of my lists, I just don't care. I have remade this list 12 times. That's the reason why this video is late. I kept doing it and I said, mm, no. And then I had to re, I have been <laughs> in a whirlwind. So these are my 10 honorable mentions of 2017. These are albums that are still incredible. They're just like literally all fighting for the same place. If I had a top 16, these would all be 16. Like this is seriously this hard to put one of them on the list. So I just had to put them all in one category. I'm gonna breeze through them. If you have any questions, why they're not on the list, why I didn't go back to them as much, blah, blah, blah. Just ask me down there. I will gladly tell you if you aren't a dick. So these are my honorable mentions in no particular order. List please. Wow. No Mountains in Manhattan by Wiki. Forever is a Mighty Long Time by Big Crit. American Teen by Khalid. Known Unknowns by Billy Woods. The Never Story by Jid. Good For You, Amine. American Badass by Joey Badass. Big Fish Theory, Vince Staples. 13 EP by Denzel Curry. And Drunk by Thundercat. Again, if you have any questions about why any of those aren't on my list that I'm about to tell you, just comment like a nice, sane human being down there. Okay, thank you. And now, ladies, gents, and people who don't address themselves by gender, the top 15 of 2017. It's the list, guys. It's the list. And at number 15, we have Action Bronson's Blue Chip 7000. I really wanted to post a reaction video to this. I had an incredible idea. I was going to cook fucking pho for you on camera, do a whole cooking show, while listening to this because Action Bronson is a chef. I was so swamped this last semester of school that I just like, fuck it, I couldn't do it. Anyway, Blue Chip 7000, I think flew under the radar for a lot of people or just didn't catch a lot of people's attention. I fucking love it, dude. This is so much better than Mr. Wonderful. I laughed out loud every track, every track. You smoke little blunts like Kevin Hart's arms. It's just nonsense rap and he paints the best pictures. He's always doing gymnastics perfectly. He's rapping about food constantly. I fucked with this project a lot. The beats are smooth. It's got this like 1970s club vibe. On the track La Luna, he raps over the on hold music. They put him on hold to rent a car and he's like, oh man, I can rap over this and then it becomes the beat. Fucking genius, dude. I fucking love that. It's really short, 13 tracks, about half an hour. Please give it a listen, especially if you're an Action Bronson fan and you were really disappointed with Mr. Wonderful. This will bring you right back, dude. He is back on his game on these classic sounding beats, talking just as much nonsense as ever. You'll definitely enjoy it. 14, another New York rapper, 1992 Deluxe by Princess Nokia. Never heard of her in my entire life. And then I watched the Melons review of it. He got me excited to listen to it. And I like the cover. It's kind of quirky. And I was like, yeah, we'll give it a chance. 
<laughs> oh, buddy, if you like New York rappers, New York dialects on beats, just like, Ugh. I fucking love the dialect, dude. When, when rappers talk like this on the track and they gonna go and bring it back to that classic hip hop when you where you at the fuck was that and she changes her voice up so much it's not even the new york dialect that attracted me she kind of goes into this high-pitched voice she goes in this low ass voice on on goth chick she plays around so much on this project you get all these sides of her personality it starts out with bart simpson which is really lo-fi laid back and she's just kind of telling you who she is what she's about and then all of a sudden goes in a banger city with katana tomboy like and then you get tracks like ABCs of New York where you can follow along with her and she will hit every single letter about New York and she's just establishing so much her foundation in hip hop, so much where she's from. All the characters that are in her head you get on this project. I was fucking floored when I first heard it and I just like replayed it, you know, three, four times in a row in the same day and I was just like, what the, what the, where, the, where the fuck was I? And Wiki is on this project too as a feature and they fucking kill it together, so why not? You got yourself a knee slapper, huh? Huh? So, uh, controversial, this next one's not an album. It's Steve Lacey's Demo by Steve Lacey at number 13. I know it's like an EP demo, because it's called a demo, but you know what? It's my fucking list, like I said. Go back to the beginning of the video and just, uh, go fuck yourself. Steve Lacey's demo, I played a lot. It's really addictive and I just had to put it on here because he fucking made this whole thing on an iPhone. He made the beat to pride on an iPhone. That's so talented, he's so fucking young. He's 19, 18, whatever, he's a teenager, he's not even 20. I can make subpar reaction videos on my, on my fucking phone and this man, this is really good. Everybody's splitting off from the internet. Matt, Sid, and Steve Lacey, they all did their single projects. It's atmospheric, it's spacey, it's in your feelings, it's groovy. There's so much personality behind it. He gives his feels on to you, and you're like, thank you, I guess, thank you, Steve Lacey. It, it just puts you into his shoes in a really professionally amateur way. Because you can still tell that it's, it's not a studio album, but it's crafted in such a way where that's part of its quirkiness and that's part of its character and you can't strip that away from it or else you lose Steve Lacey. So that's what I really like about him. He's really true to himself and making music that he wants to make how he wants to make it and how no one else is making it right now. That's fucking nuts. So that's why it had to be on the list guys. Continuing the trend of people from the internet, we have Finn by Sid. This flew under the radar for a lot of people too because this came out in, in like January? I don't know, just almost a year ago now, because it's January now. Sid came out with a fucking banger, 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 banger of a solo project. She strayed away from the band sound, the live instrumentation, all of that, and she went into her own space, she crafted her own beats, and she got a little help from other people, but mostly it's all her and it's all me was the debut single off this project. It bumps. She even came out with an EP the same year. It's kind of more of the same, it's just more lush production. She really flexes on this shit, man. She's got sexy, spacey vocals mixed with the same mood for beats. She admits she's in her feelings, that she she misses her ex, and then she finds a new girl, wants to get back with her ex, blah, blah, blah. Some fuck you, I'm independent shit. Like, there, there's a lot to love. Go listen to it, you dumb dummy. Next at number 11, we have Drive It Like It's Stolen by Injury Reserve. Again, I know it's an EP and it's not an album. It's such a new lane for Injury Reserve to take. This underrated ass group, Rogs and Parker, Richie with the T. They drop this shit, which is like thought-provoking bangers, down-to-earth singles, North Pole. That shit is so like right from here. This whole EP is right from here, from all three of them. You can feel it in the beats, you can feel it in all of their verses. They don't have to stun you with these massive strings of wordplay. This is what I'm talking about, the difference between rapping sentences and rapping to the point. They rap to the point, but they have shit to say. Other artists that I've had issues with who just rap sentences aren't saying anything. Just keep going, you keep going. Where's your point? Where's your point? These guys have a point every bar but all these bars are straightforward. It's not disguised by anything. In Boom Times 3, when Richie's talking about ghost writing and how old heads are saying, ghost writing is this big thing now, but then, you know, go back. Isn't Ice Cube writing 6-4 a known fact? I think that's the bar. Oh, fuck. Uh, uh, uh. There's so much to go back to. That's the kind of straightforward bars that provide replay value and not just rapping sentences, rapping dialogue. This is just rapping points. It's seven tracks. It's really short. They close it off perfectly. <sighs> I'm so excited for what this group has in store because they're going to release another project this year and, uh,
We've reached the top 10 and I've only spent 18 minutes talking about five of these albums. <laughs> Number 10, No One Ever Really Dies by Nerd. You saw how shocked I was. I have never heard sounds like this in my life. And I know I need to go back on Nerd and I know a lot of diehard Nerd fans are saying that this isn't their best project. And you know what? I'd probably agree. I probably would place this differently on my list had I have heard Nerd before had their older projects to ground this new one anywhere, you know? But this is this is my entry to Nerd, aside from singles I've heard before. It's unbelievable the sounds that are on this thing. The driving drums, the beat switches, and then it gets into a groovy thing, and all the features fit well. I still have to listen to this album more because there's still a lot to uncover, and like I said, the lyrics are weird, the titles are weird, there is a lot of political satire and conversation in this album that people are still not understanding where there's just some like secret code to this shit. I'm just trying to sound super duper smart. This album's really dope and that's why it's number 10. <laughs> so number nine, Saturation. One by Brockhampton. These guys met online and lived with you. Do you know how fucking terrifying that is? They're all in their 20s guys. They're all in their 20s or younger. They all just dropped their shit and moved into a house together. That's fucking crazy. Who the fuck could have predicted that this group, who is a boy band, moves in together, makes one project, didn't do so hot, two years, they hone in their craft, they get more chemistry together, then they drop Saturation, and then after they do, they said, oh, by the way, there's a sequel, and they drop the sequel and say, oh, by the way, there's a trilogy, and they drop the third, they release three back-to-back -back shockers of albums that are filled with each member's introspective shit, braggadocious shit. All right, I'm, I'm talking about everything at once. Saturation one, let's talk about that. This is their foundation, right? This is this is what broke them through, not into the mainstream, but into the public eye where people are like, holy fuck, who, who the hell is Brockhampton? Especially me. Apparently this album is a goddamn masterpiece. Never heard of them before. <sighs> They're just blowing up, man. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to listen to this. I didn't know I'd get this many requests, but calm your dick, I'm, I'm doing it. If Saturation 1 was just the only Saturation that came out this year, it would definitely be higher up. But the other two Saturations just showed that they honed in even more. They developed even more chemistry. They trimmed the fat. They understood who they were way more as a boy band on the other two projects in, in a matter of months. From the first Saturation to the second to the third, it just sounds like years of growth in months, dude. It's crazy. So Saturation 1 is number 9. Number 8, we have This Old Dog by Mac DeMarco. What a treat. What a treat this album is. What a treat this man is. Mac DeMarco is kind of the staple of the hipster youth. Like, it's kind of a meme. Super genuine. Any interview you watch of his, he's just so himself. And that's what really attracted me. Before I listened to This Old Dog, I went back, I listened to Salad Days, I listened to Two, and I was like, holy shit, I'm gonna love this guy. And then I put on this old dog, and I'm like, yes. There's a lot of comedy to be had, a lot of self-deprecation, heartbreak. He dedicates a song to his sister, to his dad that passed away, to his adulthood. He dedicates a lot of music to what is currently happening in his life. So if you ever want to know what Mac DeMarco was up to or what he was feeling, all you have to do is put on one of his albums and you'll understand that passage of his life through that project. You should be able to get that from other albums, but Mac DeMarco does it in such a specific way to himself. It's just so simple and sweet. Just like Steve Lacey, it's coming directly from here. Even if he's being goofy or serious, it's still coming from the heart. It's still him. He's taking a mix of like 80s and indie and rock and doing it all himself, having a band on tour, having a band that helps him on some songs, but Mostly, he's just got a bunch of keyboards and guitars. If a song strikes him, he just kind of does it, and then it makes an album. So cool, his process of making music, the way he views the world. This album really got to me, not, you know, it didn't make me emotional, but it really just, like, it grew on me in, a, like, a spiritual way, and I really fucked with this project a lot, and I fuck with him as an artist more, and I can't wait to see what he does in the future. At number seven, we have 444 by Jay-Z. I was very very happy with this project because everything he was coming out with was just kind of like where are you you know like you could tell there was something inside of him but he didn't really push limits and then and then he comes out with 444 this is how you do confessional rap as an old rapper <clears throat>
every track on here, he's apologizing to himself, to somebody he knows, addressing his errors as a person, addressing errors in the economy. All the production isn't this studio grade lavish bullshit that you hear all the time. All of these beats, they all take a step back with Jay-Z. They're subtle, they're sample heavy, and they have this vinyl crackle on top of all of them and it makes it sound so old school and even more introspective and more poetic. I gotta say, man, I was so pleased with this album, so happy for Jay-Z to come out with so much personal material, the most personal material he has ever done. A big thing about this top 15 and a lot of music in 2017 was it was all so vulnerable. So many artists now have understood that people want to know the artist and not just this random shit all the fucking time. Even if they already knew the artist, like Jay-Z, who's been around for fucking ever. And he comes out with 444 and people are like, who the fuck are you? This was not a, the Jay-Z I was familiar with or expecting at all. If he didn't cry every day in the studio, I'd be shocked. The story of OJ has one of the coolest music videos I have ever seen. Everything that he's been putting out for this album obviously has the money to do it But he's putting out like short films for every fucking track. It's crazy He did a black episode to friends. That was so fucking funny for moonlight, which is one of the most clever Fucking hooks I've ever heard in my life. So many bars on this project were incredibly current I'm holding money to your ear. There's a disconnect. We don't call that money over here Number six is control by SZA. She put herself on the line with this project. She admitted a lot. She dials it back and says, look, I'm kind of in my feelings about all this shit. I don't know what I'm doing. We've got 20 somethings, which is a song dedicated to everybody my age with when we're all lost, we don't know what the fuck we're doing. And she like realizes a lot about herself on control that she has control at the end of the day, at least. There's a story element with her grandma talking to her about what she went through when she was a younger girl. I think SZA is using that. Maybe her grandma can be a role model to people since she was such a role model to SZA. And then SZA becomes a role model to people because she's taking those ideals and putting it on her life and just letting you know that even a person in her position still goes through some shit too. When she is in the spotlight, nothing really changes. There's still tribulations that you have to go through as a young black woman in America, and she addresses a fucking ton of them. It's just such a genuine, sincere project, and it's beautiful. It's beautifully produced and sang. Her fucking voice is heavenly and sexy and almost defeated at times. It's so emotionally driven and strong and good. And listen to it. All right, so number five, saturation. Saturation 2 took all the ideas from Saturation 1 and just, they condensed it, made every point they wanted to make stronger, made every beat stronger. Bareface comes out with fucking Summer. One of my favorite songs of 2017. It was unbelievable the transition between Saturation 1 and Saturation 2. All the music videos, the direction they were heading was even more apparent. They had more hip hop, more introspection about themselves. Amir had a fucking confessional track, so did Don McLennan, and then they came together on one track. Tokyo, mwah, pristine, fucking pristine, pristine project. Number four, we have Brick Body Kids Still Daydream. Hey, I said it right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Again, with the vulnerable ass albums, dude. This one does kind of hide that message a little bit, but that's why I love this album. I am honestly more attracted to when messages are kind of hidden and you have to go and listen to it again and pick up on more things to really understand what he's trying to say instead of him just saying it. He says it cleverly in an artistic way that's layered and each layer you uncover, you uncover a new bar basically within the bar you already heard. He has so many metaphors that calls back to this one major theme just like the cover where he's like, my body is a building, a building, a building. You're only my friend if you're giant. There's so many references to buildings and, and to being huge, feeling larger than life, feeling like a superhero to the people in your own community, but also feeling helpless. There's always gonna be a person bigger than you to take what you're trying to prevent down. The superhero versus the world kind of mentality on this project where he's trying to protect his family, his community, a place with a lot of history, and he's trying to protect it, but realizes that he just like, he can't. And then he just kind of feels pretty much fucked. He talks about where he is in the rap world now and feeling this kind of way, feeling like he does have so much power but still can't do anything. Even about the nation, you know, Happy Wasteland Day 
has a great music video portraying that ideal. It's crazy how many things he can get across on this project in such a short amount of time. Not only is he super serious, super cohesive with the theme, but he's hilarious. Bar after bar, that's so quirky and odd, but that's, that's who he is as a rapper. And like I said before, these albums this year were so about the artist. That's why this album is number four. This thing, I love more every single time I put it on. Number three is Damn by Kendrick Lamar. What do you want me to say? Do you want me to say how he delivered flows effortlessly? That he addressed a lot of themes in multiple facets per usual that I was fucking right the whole time. Everyone said I was crazy. Everyone said I was wrong, but I was right. <laughs> a lot of people made it a meme and it still makes me feel dumb for even thinking in the first place because of it. When I made that theory up, I tried to convey that it was more or so another story inside of one album. Technically, no, it's not a brand new album. You know, it's just a brand new story a brand new side of Kendrick Lamar on the same album with the same tracks, but flipping it to create another story. I don't remember how I worded it. I probably said it was two albums, but I kind of just meant two stories to the same album. And whether it was the overarching concept or not for Kendrick waiting for people to figure that out, or he just went with the meme and was like, nah, I'm gonna make a million more dollars. And he just <laughs> re-released it again. Um, but who knows? All I knows is Damn is incredible. Another thing that Kendrick Lamar came out with that, again, just tells you that Kendrick Lamar is going to be one of the greatest of all time. And there's no argument about that. I don't know why people are afraid to call him that. He has yet to drop the ball with so many things, except maybe like being on tracks with Taylor Swift and fucking Maroon 5. Those decisions don't tarnish his entire career, you know? He's crazy, dude. I don't understand how he can keep fucking the game up, being a feature stealer, being a limelight stealer. I mean, Humble fucking shocked the world. I think a lot of people are disappointed with it because it wasn't in Pippa Butterfly, and of course it wasn't going to be. He makes different albums every time. It's a good kid to pimp to this, none of them are the same. Good Kid and Damn have more similar beat styles, but Damn still is messing with more accessible bars and beats, but still driving a point home. And that's really mentally sound and, and still makes you think of shit when it's just like a straight up banger. Do we even have to talk about DNA, dude? And Pride, again, was made on an iPhone by Steve Lacey. And fucking U2, U2's on it. Bono, what the fuck? It just. It's damn. Number two, guys. What's it gonna be? Number two is Saturation 3. Wow, that's surprising. Wow. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me set this up for you. I work at a wine bar as the kitchen manager, okay? Which means I'm by myself for like six, seven hours every day cooking pizzas and appetizers. When Saturation 3 dropped, I am not kidding you, four of those shifts, all I played on repeat back to back to back was Saturation 3, and I would gladly do it again. This album takes everything from the last Saturation, and again, bumps it the fuck up. Every track is perfectly placed. Boogie is their best opener that they've ever had. Ending with Team, with a, a mic being passed back and forth between all the guys, perfect way to wrap up the trilogy and to wrap up Saturation 3 as an album. And then you have everything in between. Boogie to Zipper to Johnny, Oh my God, Johnny with Joba's verse and he can't even listen to it because it, it gets him way too deep in his feelings. I'm obsessed with rental. I'm obsessed with stupid. And Merlin Woods fucking murdered everything he was on. He's always the odd man out. Matt Champion was unbelievable. Dom was unbelievable. Kevin is still a master at hooks. These beats, Ramil, unbelievable, dude. The beat switches are crazy. Sister Nation. And when I see Sister Nation live, I'm putting somebody in the hospital. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a Beyblade in the pit, guys. I'm just gonna be spinning and, and letting her rip. I'm gonna be knocking bitches over, not women, because that's wrong, but like people who shop at Hot Topic. I am in love with this boy band, guys. I'm in love with them. They are so inspiring. I don't care if I'm a fanboy or a stan of them. I don't care. I'm glad I am because they've given me a lot as a person and as an artist, why would I try to second guess that kind of feeling because people are telling me that I hype them up too much. Like, So now we have the number one spot. I know a lot of people are gonna be surprised that it wasn't Brockhampton, but let me tell you, 
there was an album I liked more. White Trash by Tabby. I'm the best fucking artist of the whole fucking world, bitch. I'm just kidding. It's not my own fucking project. Number one is Scumfuck Flower Boy by Tyler the Creator. It took me a lot of listens to come to this realization that it is the best album of the year to me because being a longtime fan of Tyler the Creator, I have never known who Tyler the Creator was. And this is this big ass point that I've been driving this entire video where even if you've heard an artist over and over and over again, you still want to know them. Tyler has never in his life been so introspective and so the fucking golden word of this video, vulnerable. He sounds damaged, lonely. He just sounds so real. The music sounds so real and from the soul. All the bangers have points. Every track just melts into the next. Garden Shed is the best song Tyler's ever made. Everything about this album is crisp, expertly crafted, dude. The, the mixing on everything, the vocals, the features, the layering. Tyler was never in anybody's mind the type of person to make an album like this, even half like this, where you admit so much about yourself in such a short amount of time. To really look at himself in a mirror, you know, in a metaphorical mirror and be like, who, who am I? to me, not to everybody else, but to me. He really did this album for him. He didn't do this to, to say like, oh no guys, I can be soft sometimes. I can be in my feelings sometimes too. No, he, he did it because he needed to. He had so much to say. And whether or not all these, is he gay allegations are true or whatever the hell they're trying to pass, who, who cares? Because he made something so beautiful and the title was perfect, scumfuck. Flower Boy, this hard exterior covering someone who's troubled and someone who isn't as aggressive and vulgar as they seem to be, who actually has a lot of shit that they're, that they're dealing with. And the way it ends where he steps out of the McLaren that he talks about all the time, steps out and just like leaves it, means so much. If that means he's coming out of the closet, or just coming out of hiding behind this facade, whatever he was hiding behind, he ended the album with coming out of that. And that's beautiful. So poetically strong. And it has to be number one because not only is it Tyler's best project, but I've never heard such a switch with an artist. He came out with this project with nothing to prove, but proved so much. I was just in awe and still am in awe every time I listen to this project. He's got a Grammy nomination, dude, and Grammy, Grammys don't mean shit, really, but Tyler, the creator, got a Grammy nomination. When the fuck would anybody think that was gonna happen? I'm very proud of him for doing what he did, releasing what he did, and where he is now. I think you get the point. Scumfuck Flower Boy is the best album of 2017 for me. <laughs> Holy shit, I just talked for an hour by myself. Thank you guys for supporting me. We're almost at 50,000 subscribers. I know there's channels with more fucking subscribers and everybody's saying, oh, you deserve a million and all this shit. And like, obviously, thank you for saying that. But do you know how crazy 50,000? I will never take any of what is advancing me for granted with my videos or with my music, and especially with my music and you guys supporting me. It was a joke to say White Trash was the number one, but like White Trash was a very important moment in my life. I put a lot of myself on there too. And so many people put it on their top tens and that's nuts to me. Big Quinn gave me an honorable mention and I'm not trying to like jerk myself off here. I'm just saying that I had a pretty big year. I had these two huge lull periods where I couldn't make videos and people still stuck with me and I haven't suffered an extreme drop in views. I'm, I'm just like so thankful for all of you and this coming year, I cannot wait to keep growing with you guys. This is such a blessing to me, you know, and I'm not a religious guy, but whatever a blessing means to me, this is it. This is the most blessed I have been doing what I love, listening to music, making videos, making entertainment for you guys, making content. It's always been one of my dreams. Let's pray that 2018 socially and governmentally is a better year. Please subscribe if you haven't. Welcome to the channel if you're new. And if you're not new, fuck is up, bitch. Got anything to say to the fans? Ow! The fuck is that?